Well, by and large, it's, it's not too bad here. Um, we face the same problems here in Norway as all musicians around the world do, that we cannot tour, we cannot do festivals, we cannot do shows. Uh, and that limits us, and that, that's quite, quite annoying. Uh, but on the other hand, the situation isn't too bad here in Norway. Um, um, not too many people catch the, di the disease, and, and, and we don't have overfilled hospitals and all of that. So, so we get by fairly well, and it seems that things are more or less under control here in, in our country. So, so that's a good thing. And apart from that, I hope this thing will go away pretty soon so we can start going back to a more normal daily life again, because that would be something. The albums have hardly been available for many years. And the primary reason for us to do this, uh, we have known for quite quite some time that it needed to be done, uh, that we should make the albums available again. And these were originally released through True Moonfog, which is a label that do not exist anymore. So, so they needed to find a new home. And <coughs> And you know that that process is is uh, requiring some some work, um, but this felt like a good time for us to do it. And um, I mean, it's not that we that we don't have other tasks, but but now that we cannot play live at all, um, that gives us a little extra time on our hands to to do other things that needs to be done with this band. And uh, that meant that we could finally see to it that the old albums get reissued. Uh, and if we do that, we might as well try to do some improvements sound-wise um, and regarding artwork. So that, you know, when we present the albums to people again, that there is, you know, a little extra and it, it feels more right for us also. So, so the albums aren't really hampered with them in, in any way. They, they sound based, if you like, the originals do. But, uh, but there are a few improvements done to the production and the artwork looks better now. So, so that was also something that we wanted to have done, but, uh, you know, we didn't feel like doing it before we came to this point, because Satir Satirpan is typically a band that likes to focus on on the future and what lies ahead rather than what has already been done. So that's why it took some time. But, but it's happening now in this group. Yeah, no, the, the stories with the two albums are a bit, a bit different, but, but in both cases we felt that the original ideas for the cover wasn't properly expressed. So we darkened it times. We had this idea that it should have some sort of a medieval darkness and melancholy to it, something that was a bit grim and a bit sorrow-filled and which reflected our wish of of the medieval times, and in addition to that, there was, you know, bottomless poverty in this country. And, and, um, and there was disease, and type of nature, which makes it very, very hard to, to grow and harvest your own crops. And basically, you know, there, there is shortage all over the line and, and very, very very much difficulty and, and you had also a type of, of mentality and culture that made it even worse. So, so that was something that we wanted to reflect on the cover. Uh, um, Satir was instructing an artist to, to make something unique for Satir and for Dark Medieval Times because that, that was what we wanted. We wanted our music to to be something that uh, nobody else were doing. And in the same line, we wanted our cover to be our very own cover that you wouldn't see anywhere else. So I guess that idea was good. Um, 
and we got the drawing back from the artist that we kind of liked, but that we felt perhaps was a bit cartoonish and not completely in line with what we had imagined for that color. But also, we just felt that, you know, this was what was being made for us. We liked the drawing, and even if it wasn't ideal, we decided to go for it. And then we had this drawing by Norwegian artist Theodor Kittlesen called Pespa Draghi, that Satyr had basically felt all along was the perfect cover for Dark Little Times from the very beginning. It was just that, you know, he was a bit hesitant to to put something on there which was already published. So rather than putting it on the front cover, he put it on the booklet of the album. So so, so it was there on the original as well. Um, but I guess that he has perhaps regretted that decision a little after it, it was done. And now that we reached the album, of course, you know, he puts the cover there that should have been there all along. So, so what has always been the correct spiritual cover for Dark and Demon Times, uh, according to Satir, is it's now the actual cover for the album the version. Uh, and as far as the Shadow Song is concerned, uh, Satir had an idea about what the cover should be like. Um, which was in some way expressed in a photograph that he, he did put on the cover uh, because he wanted there to be some some earthy tones uh, he wanted it to be a little silent and mystical and eerie and connected to to the woods uh, rather than being you know aggressive and violent and uh, having a lot going on, um, but again, I guess that he felt that his idea was a bit too vaguely expressed in the cover. Uh, and when you see that photograph as a cover, it's almost impossible to really see anything. You know, you don't really get an idea of what it was. So, so that was a bit too obscure, perhaps. Um, Satir stumbled upon this. Um, painting by Norwegian artist uh, Harald Solberg, uh, not too long ago, actually. Um, and he saw this painting called uh, called uh, Not the Glad, which could be translated into Night's Glow in English. And he felt that this was the perfect cover for the shadow song. It had that kind of... of um, right colors, it had kind of glow, it had uh, the coldness and the eeriness and, and the mysteriousness to it. Um, basically, you know, just just the right vibe and the right energy and the right spirit. So it connects just perfectly to the Shadow Throne. So it was a bit... Um, a bit cool, but also a bit weird that we should end up finding the perfect cover for the Shadows after that many years. But um, luckily, he found it before we were we were doing these reissues, and, and it has now become the cover for the album, and, and that feels really good. Yeah, it, it was re reissued for for the twentieth anniversary. It didn't really need it, um, so you know we we just kind of did some very, very, very subtle changes in order to, uh, yeah, make the color palette of it a little more right and to give it a little more and more brightness and the right tone. But apart from that, we, we didn't really do anything because that color really worked from the start and there was no need to do anything with it. In many ways, I, I, I answer on behalf of Satir here because he was the man who, who, who found that picture and, and realized that it needed to be the cover and he was the one to really, you know, connect to it. But personally, I, I liked it a lot. And I couldn't dream of anything that would work as well as a cover for that album as that monk, uh, as that monk uh, drawing does. Um, and I think that, you know, there is definitely a story behind it. 
uh, because uh, Satira was given access to to a large catalogue of um, monk works uh, in relation to an exhibit. Um, and the man that has been a graphical designer for Satira, a um, bit on and off, you know, since uh, the, the Shadows Run days, he was taking part in this monk exhibit. Uh, and I think two of them had recently been been working on the Nemesis uh, Divina revised cover, and that this graphical design would also work with Satirica on the next album, which would end up being Deep Calls Upon Deep. Uh, this designer gave Satirica access to this moon catalog, having a lot of pictures that aren't that known to the public. Many of them have hardly been exhibited at all, and, uh, and they are more or less obscure works for most people. Uh, uh, at some point, when Satir was um, was watching all of these different paintings and drawings and other works in the monk catalog, he saw he saw this um, the kiss of death picture, and that just spoke to him immediately, and it spoke clearly and deeply. Uh, and he has said on several occasions that he connected with it on a very deep level and he felt that it, it was, you know, the, the visual projection of everything that Deep Calls Upon Deep is, is about. Uh, it was almost as if Monk should have heard the album like more than a hundred years ago when, when the picture was made. And, and make a cover for that album. It would have been something like that because uh, everything just came together for, for Satir at that point. He had a pretty critical health uh, issue and also he was deeply involved with, with the work of an album that, you know, was, was uh, Satiricon, Satiricon's most ambitious work to that date. Uh, and as he was looking for a cover motive, he saw this thing that, you know, just presented its, itself to him as the cover for the album in a way that, you know, it, it just couldn't be doubted. It felt like it was a projection of his own mind with everything that was going on there. And it felt it was like a projection of the music of Deep Calls Upon Deep, which was being made at that point, because Satir found this picture not that long before the album was actually released, so it was one of the very last things that happened, you know, before we we actually finished the whole process with that album, where it comes from. And, and later, uh, it stirred quite some controversy, which was, which was a bit weird, you know, because the it, it, it turned out that the picture was pretty conver controversial in 18, 18, no, I think it was released the first time in 1898 or 99. And it was controversial then, but it's a bit weird that it should be controversial among the black metal people today. But at least what is really important for us is that it has, you know, a kind of, of spirit to it that connects very well with, with the album itself. Uh, the thematics fits perfectly, you know. Um, um, the, the way that things seem to move on the picture while also being, you know, very yeah, very simple and still in a way also makes a lot of sense that it's it's very alive, but it's also feeling feeling very very dark and almost like it belongs to the realm of death already. And you know, there there were just so many things that that made it made it work. 
But, uh, but we are very happy with it. Uh, I'm very happy with it still, and, and so is the interior. It's something that, you know, we, if we had gone through the same process, I hope we would have ended up with exactly that picture again, because it's just perfect for the album. Yeah, perhaps because it seems like a very, very simple drawing to some people if they don't, you know, understand. Almost like the, a, a child's drawing, you know. Um, and I would object very, very heavily to that because I think it's filled with the spirit of someone who has gone through a lot of hardship and it couldn't be made by anyone else than an adult with quite a lot of experience and baggage. And, and actually, if you study it a bit more closely, you see that it, it, it is indeed by, made with someone that really has art, artistic skills on the highest level, but just, you know, immediately it could seem very, very simple and, and childlike to, to some people, and I can understand it. So, I mean, it has always been something that Satyricon has struggled against. We did, we did that already with, you know, Dark and Evil Times. It was a bit controversial to, to have um, other instruments than the traditional in instruments on the Black and Cloud. So we put, you know, some folk instruments and we, we used a synthesizer and, and we used um, used the acoustic guitar and yeah, we brought in quite a bit that was a bit unconventional at least. And that was a bit con controversial then. And, and later on, you know, we had done all sorts of different experiments and, and we have dared to push boundaries, but, but always for a reason. I, we have done it because we think that the music needs it or, or the band needs it and we have we have dared to be unconventional with, when it comes to the music itself. We have dared to be unconventional when it comes to some of the solutions and the instruments that we use. We have dared to be unconventional when it comes to sound and production. And we have also dared to be unconventional when it comes to artwork and the visual presentation of Satyricon. And that's, that's really who we are, I mean, Satyricon can never be about adhering to standards and conventions and, and routines and formulas and all of these, you know, conservative and very set things. We, we think that black metal is a genre that was born to be very much alive. It was born by pioneering souls. And it was born by people who dared to do things that weren't done before, and they were bold about it, and they were daring. And we think that we need to still be that today in order to keep this genre alive. And we we use satyricon as our instrument to to do what we feel to be right for for this genre, and, and that means you know sometimes do things that you know will stir up a lot of controversy and and be certain that whatever you do if you feel that it's 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 right for you and for the band then do it no matter what because you will you will win in the long run um yeah yeah in, in one way that that is very right and, <laughs> and i mean if if people feel that you have albums that represent their idea of what things should be like 100% then they can stick to have you know a wider variety of experiences and people that likes to be challenged and have new kinds of experiences and Satyricon is a band like that and we are people like that and we try to reach out to, to people that think along those lines and you have so many of these formula bands in this genre already that you know do different versions of one particular album over and over again, and you always know what you get from them. And that, that's okay. But we don't need Satyricon to be one of them. I guess that it must have started with me here uh, Motorhead for the first time when I was nine years old. Okay, even before teenagers. Uh, 
Because yeah, well, I mean, I don't think oh, that was early. I think oh, it was a little late, actually, but that was my first really groundbreaking experience with music at all. Uh, I had listened to music up until that point, not really active. It didn't really mean much to me. But then I heard the song Iron Fist by Motred on, on radio, I think, uh, at one point. And uh, it made such an impression on me. It was like I could think about nothing else for for a week or, or more. It was like being on repeat in my head. And there was just something larger than life about that song for me. The rawness of it and, and the energy and the voice of Lemmy and, you know, the way that I found it to be very fast and hard and, and that just gave me a lot of, gave me a lot of energy and it opened up, you know, a door to a realm in my head that I didn't even know was there. So, so of course, you know, I was seeking to relive that experience afterwards, so I was, I was getting into hard rock and metal music eventually. Uh, and as I typically gravitate towards what had lots of energy and that, you know, felt raw and, and action filled, I eventually discovered more extreme kinds of metal. So, so I got into trash metal and then the other extreme metal genres after that. Uh, and at some point I got to hear the debut album by, by Bassery. And I sent a sense that there was something dark to it as well. And I didn't really figure out exactly why I liked that, but it just spoke to me in a way. And I like to, you know, put up um, posters that I made myself uh, of the, the cover from, from the first Bassery album and also from the Pentagram on the back cover, I put it up on, on the wall of my, my bedroom and I turned off the lights and so I could barely, you know, see the pentagram and the goat and, and I listened to the music and just got immersed in it and somehow that was an experience that was very rewarding for me. And eventually I also discovered the lifestyle and and the ideology that was connected to black metal and, and I just sucked it up. I, I didn't really, you know, understand it completely or grasp it completely in the beginning, but I just knew that I had to go. That um, everybody who are into it will kind of know it when, when they share it with, with anyone else. I mean, uh, for me, it was about uh, about seeking the music first of all and discovering that it was there uh, and, and feeling what kind of energy was there and you know really connected with it. and then eventually discover that, that there was something about darkness that just resonated deeply within it was something about these uh, nocturnal atmospheres uh, and uh, it was something about, you know, turning over to night mode even in the middle of the day. Uh, it was something about seeking desolation uh, and, and the deepness of your own soul and your own thoughts. And I think most black people have, have gone through that and they probably feel that the depths within are, are something that you connect very well with when, when you listen to music. And I think it, you know, darkness is so much about the unknown and about challenges and finding your own way. And that is something that I, that I have kind of stayed with even to this day that you know, I I think that bringing evilness and, and that, all that into negativity in general is the wrong path. I think that there is so much more to it. But what even sticks today is that uh, the dark path is, is 
wire that you have to to go yourself because there are no others there to to light it up for you and it in in short means to 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 find your own truth to find your own way and not seek you know any kind of um collective um gods or 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 super beings but rather try to f to find the strength that that you can find inside of yourself um and where you have to go on your very own and, and that is the dark path but um, um and it's uh, and it's a path that you can can get access to or get in touch with through listening to good black music for instance there are countless other ways but i i i connect black metal with that and also the fact that it has a lifestyle to uh, which is in many ways a little bit like like punk in the way that you know you have the leather and you have a pretty radical kind of uh, appearance uh, and you have the you have the spikes and all of that which is something that appeals to me and which you understand is just you know one of very very many faces of that that is also something that that really appealed to me a lot as as a team and that i can can still like but i also see that as you have gone through a phase where that has been part of it you can also find other ways to express something that is a bit in a way a bit similar but that still makes sense when you're in, in your forties or or, or or even older. But I mean, uh, there's 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 just so much. Yeah. No. Perhaps. <laughs> perhaps, but, uh, perhaps that's why some of us in, in this genre have some, you know, the odd types that seek some either some kind of desolation or turn or inwards or perhaps do do the opposite. At some point, you know, um, a belief could pay way to something that you treat as a certainty. But also, it could be so that um, rather than having a belief that that you take from anybody else and that you share with anybody else, you realize that there cannot be truth to anything that comes from from anybody else, because if somebody is trying to, for instance, tell you about uh, God, which is supposed to, you know, be a relevant being for all people, then what you perceive as this God would necessarily be different than what the other person is telling you.